and uh, get our um, get our webinar started. Welcome everyone. This is the fourth webinar in our series of Universe of Learning Affiliations, uh, Smithsonian Affiliations Community of Practice webinars. And uh, today we're um, we're again looking at the second big question of uh, NASA astrophysics in terms of asking how we got here in our place in space and time. And um, Brandon uh, Lawton is going to uh, give us an overview of um, the, how we uh, understand the past of the universe. So uh, let's see, why. Next, next slide, please. How to do next slide. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, so uh, I, I think most of you who've been here for some of the prior webinars know us, uh, myself and Erica from the uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, and Tim and Brandon from the Space Telescope Science Institute, two of the uh, five institutions that are part of the Universe of Learning Consortium. And next slide, we also have on the line. Um, uh, Patty Artiega, who's the uh, project coordinator. Hi, Patty, and your Hi. contact at Smithsonian Affiliations. And she works with Caroline and Christina, who I know all of you affiliates know well. So next slide today, our subject matter specialist is uh, Dr. Scott Randall. And he'll be um, uh, joining us a little bit later in the webinar. And he is, uh, there he is, excellent. <laughs> He's, um, uh, astrophysicist, astrophysicist and time mission planner, um, and you'll be able to ask him questions about what that means as well as questions about his topic. Next slide. The um, uh, topics we're going to kind of cover today are um, using light as a tool to study the early universe, this idea of looking out as looking back. Um, Scott is going to uh, talk to us about evidence for dark matter. We brought up this this crazy mystery in astrophysics about uh, dark matter a couple webinars ago, and Scott, that's actually one of his research areas, so he'll talk a bit about that, and as usual, we'll go over resources. Um, so uh, I guess then, without further ado, uh, Brandon, the... Um, sure. The, floor is yours. All right. That was record time. All right. Um, thanks, Mary. So, right. So in this, in this webinar, we want to explore the distant universe, the idea of how did we get here, and um, understanding how light can be a tool to explore, to explore those questions. Now, if you recall, um, in several webinars now, we have talked about the, briefly the deep fields. So I, what, I, what I show in the first picture there at the top is one of the Hubble uh, deep fields. And that's really a small patch of sky that Hubble observed. Um, and so it was able to collect light over many days. And you see galaxies from across space and time in that image. You see way, way back to you know, a good fraction of the, uh, of the life of the universe there. Um, and why do we want to do this? Why do we want to take images of galaxies in, the deep, in, you know, in these deep fields? Well, really, it's the idea is to answer the question, how did we get here? If you see the, the, the final arrow pointing to that artist uh, schematic of what our Milky Way looks like, that grand design spiral on the right, we want to understand how it is that we are able to live in this nice, majestic spiral galaxy today, almost 14 billion years after the Big Bang. To understand that, we have to understand how, over the course of those 14 billion years, galaxies were have changed with time, how they were essentially born, if you will, and how they've changed over the course of the 14 billion years. Now, just like, uh, just like you know, for those of you that are parents or, or just around small kids, you may recognize the, the fact, right, that when you're a really small child, you undergo some of the most changes you will ever see a human being go through in the first two, three, five years of their life. The same is true for galaxies, we believe. Uh, understanding those very first baby galaxies in the early universe after the Big Bang um, will help us understand how galaxies form later in the universe or how they came to become what they look like later in the universe because they've changed so much in those first uh, several hundred million years 
So, you know, the time scale is a little different, three years, 100 million years, but um, the same sort of concept is there. The, the arrow from the deep field to these middle slices here just show you what, a spiral, what spiral galaxies look like if you go back and look at them at different epochs or different times in the universe's history. So you'll notice on the left, going from left to right, that the spiral galaxies appeared redder. They appeared a bit more disorganized and, and somewhat smaller in these images. And as you go towards the right and you get closer to today's universe, the galaxies look a bit more organ. The spiral galaxies at least look a bit more organized, um, generally bluer and um, and larger. So that's the question, really. How do we get a picture of these of these really baby galaxies in the distant universe? Because they're very faint and they're very far away. Um, we've done a lot of studies over decades now of nearby galaxies and intermediate um, range galaxies from us, but really it's those baby galaxies that we're really interested in, in observing. So. Before we get into that, let's just quickly talk. I'm just going to go over this slide very quickly, but I just wanted to mention that in order to understand how, how light can basically be used as a tool here, you have to understand that the speed of light is a constant. It has a speed. It's a constant in a vacuum as it travels through space. So the first time that this was really measured, that the speed of light was measured, was in the 1600s by a Danish astronomer um, who was studying Jupiter's eclipsing of Jupiter's moon Io as it went behind Jupiter. Um, and, as, and from Earth's perspective in different seasons, he noticed that the time it took for the Io to be eclipsed depended on where we were in our orbit, basically where we were from our separation from us and Jupiter. Um, and he noticed there was a time delay, which he associated with the, time it, the extra time it took light to get here from Jupiter um, when we were further away from Jupiter. And so he was the first person to really put a measurement then you have Jean Foucault in the 1850s who did a measurement of the speed of light in a laboratory and got a much more accurate measurement of the speed of light. And then moving on, and again in the 1800s, there's a famous Michelson-Morley experiment that really showed that not just the, that the speed of light was a constant, but showed that the speed that, that the light waves that come to us from the universe do not require a medium to pass through. There's no sort of quote-unquote ether, which astronomers at the time thought might exist. Like you, you look at waves in the ocean, right? The waves pass through water, it passes through some medium. It's, it's waves that pass through material. Light waves do not require that. And then of course it was Einstein um, in the earliest, early part of the 20th century who um, derived the general theory of relativity, which really finally gave us a good explanation of how, um, how light and gravity behave in the universe. All right, so that's sort of a quick history of measurement speed of light. There's of course many others. Um, so let's just get some examples on the screen. So telescopes are time machines. Just to give you some idea, since light has a constant speed, the further away an object is from Earth, the longer it takes light to reach us from those objects. So for example, you see the sun, the closest star to us, it takes eight minutes to reach us from the sun. And so that is why we say that the sun is um, eight minutes light minutes away. Uh, Andromeda galaxy, the nearby spiral galaxy. By the way, we can stop. I, I, I recall we were supposed to have another poll somewhere. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to jump the gun and give away the... <laughs> so before we get further into this... Um... Oops, wait. Whoa, whoa. Wrong one. Okay. There we go. Right. So if you just want to take a, a, a moment here to just look at this uh, poll and, and provide an answer, and then we'll go over it in the, in the previous poll as well. So I'm sharing the results there of the first five people who answered. Okay. So should we move on then? Yep. You, okay. You, you can note the yeah. difference here. I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like um, a plurality of people uh, selected distance. A light year is a measure of distance. And that is correct. Um, and I know this can be quite confusing because when we talk about uh, light minutes, right, or we talk about light years, it sounds like a time. But it's really the distance light takes in that amount of time. It's a measurement of distance. So for example, eight light minutes is the distance it takes light to travel eight minutes, 
right? Nin 93 so, million miles. <laughs> 93 million miles, yeah. <laughs> so, so light is, uh, oh, sorry, so light, a light year is a measure of distance. Uh, so you see the Andromeda galaxy in the middle there. That is so, that is much further away. That's outside our Milky Way. That's the nearest grand spiral to us. That is so far away that we generally don't refer to it in a distance of light minutes because it would be so big. So we refer to it in um, millions of light years. Okay, so that's 2.5 million light years, or that's the distance light travels in 2.5 million years. Um, another way to think about that is this is a snapshot or a picture of that galaxy as it looked 2.5 million years ago. Okay, so there is a direct translation from that distance to a time. Okay. Um, on the far right, you see again that Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a snapshot of galaxies. Um, this is actually, it looks, it's a 2D image here, but it's really three dimensional information. There's galaxies scattered all across the universe. It's almost like a core sample through the universe where we see, um, where we see galaxies anywhere from relatively nearby all the way up to close to 13 billion light years away. Um, so a significant fraction of the, uh, of the age of the universe. So again, the furthest galaxies in that image took about 13 billion years um, to reach us. Now that original poll question was about how long would it take us to observe Sirius the star if, I believe the question was it if it exploded. Um, uh, quite a violent thing. Okay, so <laughs> that would be, that would be, uh, that would be on the order of, of light years, right? So the nearest star to us is around four light years away. So, so it would be on the order of light years to see any stars in our Milky Way um, if they were happen to just uh, um, explode as some do actually. All right, um, so let's go ahead and move on. Let's see if I can, all right, there we go. So I wanna um, go back to this idea about what Einstein was able to tell us. So this is, this is a little animation about how Einstein Basically, his general theory of relativity tells us how light works. That grid is basically space time itself, and light likes to travel in a straight line. But if you have a mass like a star in space time, the mass will bend space time, and the light will follow the curvature of space time, bending the light. I'll play that one more time. And that is basically the idea of what gravity is. So, gravity is not so much a force of something pulling on something else, it's really just the effect of seeing things follow the curvature of space-time, and that space-time is curved in the presence of any mass, but the, the more mass you have, the greater the curvature, okay? So a star is going to curve space-time more than a human will, okay? So anything with mass will bend space-time. And so Einstein's general theory, theory of relativity basically explained how this happens, how mass can bend space-time. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, now, actually, what do you observe when this happens in, in, in the universe? These are some Hubble Space Telescope snapshots of, uh, of galaxies that have bent space-time, and those, that's what those yellowish-orange blobs are. They are basically these, these spherical-type galaxies that are nearer to us that have bent space-time, and behind them are galaxies that the light from those galaxies were bent by the curved space-time and came to us in these odd, weird shapes. Sometimes if, they, if they're curved and they appear to us as a ring, we call those an Einstein ring. Sometimes they appear as like points of a cross, we call that an Einstein cross. But you get these weird effects, these funhouse mirror effects from the, from the light actually following bent space-time. And we actually call this lensing, but I'll get into that in a minute. But just so you have an idea, you can recreate something similar just with using some interesting shape, uh, curved glass for, for an optics experiment. On the right is an actual image of a, of a lensed galaxy, um, a curved galaxy on the, you know, there's that again, that orange blob that's actually bending space time. And the blue is actually one galaxy that's been stretched and curved as it's followed the curvature of space around that more closer galaxy. So as you see on the, in the wine glass stem experiment over here, depending on if you have a little flame or a light and you have a wine glass, depending on how you look at the flame through the wine glass, you can recreate these same shapes. Now on the left, it's actually optics. It's actually glass doing the, the changing the, the direction of the light and making these interesting shapes. On the right, 
it is actually the curvature of space-time from the mass that's causing this to happen, okay? All right, so how can we use this? All right, so here is actually a cluster of galaxies. So this is an illustration of a background galaxy. Light rays, imagine light rays actually coming out in all directions, not just those four. And then as it hits that giant cluster of galaxies, and the universe has these clusters of galaxies, you'll hear more about that from uh, Dr. Scott, Scott Randall in, in a minute, but these clusters are really massive and they really bend space-time in a really interesting way. And so as these light rays from these more distant galaxies come out in all directions, those ones that interact with that curved space-time will be warped and bent and redirected and oftentimes they will come back to our telescopes. In fact, you notice that these four light rays here would not have reached the Hubble Space Telescope at all, except for those four light rays were actually redirected to Hubble. So you actually get more light coming from this distant object than you otherwise would, which is why this is a powerful tool. Astronomers can use this to actually observe objects they wouldn't otherwise be able to observe with their telescopes because they would otherwise be too faint. This lensing allows us to collect extra light and actually magnifies the background galaxies. It makes them brighter than they otherwise would be. So you can actually use the power of a space telescope along with what we say the power of nature's lens, if you will, in combination to see things much further than you would otherwise be able to see. So that's a very powerful tool. And again, the whole goal, right, is to go back and try to look at the furthest galaxies, the most distant, faint galaxies. It would be the baby galaxies uh, that were first formed after the Big Bang. Here's just a quick, fun demonstration of what this gravitational lensing would look like, would really actually look like. This is an actual simulation. We're gonna, I'm just going to hit play. You're going to start with a famous, um, and I might fast forward this just to get to the good parts, but um, you're going to start with, there's a galaxy cluster here, and then you're going to see a famous image of the Whirlpool galaxy from Hubble pop up. This is a famous image. Imagine what that galaxy would look like if you placed it behind that galaxy cluster. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to, let me fast forward it. There we go. On the left is sort of a top-down view, if you had that view. The cluster is between us and the Whirlpool. As the Whirlpool moves on the right, you're actually going to see what you would observe from Hubble. The Whirlpool galaxy, oh, look, there's like four Whirlpools there. So that the lensing actually can make a galaxy appear in multiple places on the sky. It's the same galaxy, but the light gets redirected and can appear in multiple places and can have these funny stretching effects on the actual original galaxy that you observe. Okay, so that's, that's what you would see from a famous Hubble object placed behind the galaxy cluster. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Now, I wanna just quickly mention the NASA Frontier Fields Program. This is a program that's led by NASA's great observatories, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and this really is, the science goals of this are, multi, are multiple. For the purpose of, the, of, of what I've just been talking to you about, one of the science goals is to use this, is to do these deep fields of these galaxy cluster images and use the gravitational lensing to actually peer back further than we could before. There's also a lot of science being done, which you'll, I believe, hear more about um, in a minute in terms of understanding galaxy clusters themselves and the physics of what's going on in the galaxy clusters. So let me just, I should also just mention, the Frontier Fields program um, was started around 2013, 2014, um, and the observing campaign for the Frontier Fields is over, but the science is really just beginning, so the science is ongoing. So we have the images in place, and, it's, and they're basically six, they're looking at six galaxy cluster fields. Um, at the same time, they're also looking at six normal deep fields as a comparison, but for this purpose of this, we'll, we'll talk about the galaxy cluster fields. So here is one of those galaxy cluster fields. This is Abel 2744 is the name. It's a nice fancy name, I know. Um, you can see in this galaxy cluster, we have a multi, um, it's a composite image of both of Chandra, Hubble, and Spitzer. So Chandra looks in the x-rays, and in blue, you'll see in the x-rays, you'll see this really hot, really hot gas in the galaxy cluster. So that blue is really coming from the galaxy cluster itself, this really hot gas. In green is the Hubble, that's visible light. You're really seeing the galaxies pop out. And in red, Spitzer and the infrared, 
what you're really seeing is you're really seeing um, the galaxies as well, but you're seeing parts of the galaxies that are really undergoing star formation and so on. So there, it picks out a different piece of the galaxies or different information you can learn from those galaxies. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but that's just some idea. So most of these galaxies you see in this image are actually in the galaxy cluster, but there's actually a lot more actually, it, they're hard to see here, that are behind it that are just the small faint little dots, the little smudges. And those are, when we're talking about looking back in time, looking at the furthest galaxies, those are the things we're trying to get at. Those things that are behind this galaxy cluster that may have been lensed. So how do we actually do this? This is a big difficult um, question, a big difficult problem. So let me just brief, briefly mention that a lot of what we do in science in general, but also particularly for this program, is combine our understanding of the physics of the process. So in this case, it's, it's the general relativity, Einstein's theory of general relativity and the physics of what's going on with our observations. And when we have the physics, we can create models of it in the computer. And then we can compare those models with our observations and they can inform each other. And I want to give you an example of that here. So on the left, you have a, this is that same cluster I showed you on the previous slide. You go back, it's a zoom in of the center of that cluster. But on the left is a zoom in of that cluster. And in blue is a model of the mass distribution of the galaxy cluster, right? So that is, that is the mass distribution of the galaxy cluster. That tells you where the mass is located in the galaxy cluster. And you need to know that to understand how space-time is warped, right? So if you know where the mass is located, you know where the curvature of space-time is happening in, around that cluster. I should mention, you'll hear more about this um, in a minute again from Dr. Scott Randall, but most of that mass in a galaxy cluster is in the form of this uh, enigmatic dark matter, okay? But you'll hear more about that in a minute. So that is an understanding of what the mass distribution is. So if you have that, um, and you have an understanding of where the curvature is, then you can actually make models of where around that cluster you would expect the greatest magnification to be from the lensing, okay? Where is the curvature of space so great that you'll have the greatest magnification? And that is what those pink curves are. Those are the locations where you'll expect to have the greatest magnification. And so that's where astronomers can then go look and do um, sensitive detail analysis of the image to see, are they seeing multiple images of a distant galaxy that matches up where they expect to from those pink curves? Um, and that's all from the modeling. Um, and on the right, you'll actually see some circles. These are candidate galaxies that are really distant. You actually can't see them in the image. Um, they're actually so faint that they don't show up in the stretch of the image here, but you can use some detail analysis to pull them out. Um, and I'll show you an, 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 another concrete example on the next slide of that. Um, but I also want to make the point that once they actually they use this technique to find these distant galaxies, once they can actually use, basically play back, use the model to play back the light rays to understand where they actually came from in space and time behind the cluster and to piece together what the galaxy actually looks like to some degree. And then they can, that not only helps them analyze the original galaxy that was lensed, but it also lets them put more details into their model to better the model itself. So the, so, the, so the model helps us inform the observations and where to look. Once we have that, the observations then help inform the model to get better. And it's this cyclical thing that happens in science. It's this process of science where they sort of better each other. When we get better models, we get better understanding of our data. When we get better data, we get better models and so on. So let me show you what an actual real result of this. So. This is, again, that same galaxy cluster. And these are what you see in boxes there and you see blown up. This is actually what it looks like when you blow it up. Are really distant galaxies, some of the most distant ones yet found in the Frontier Fields program. Um, and what they did was they used the models to find, to find, to look around those greatest areas of magnification and found A and B, okay? They found A and B. Um, and then they used, and then they went back and they, they they looked at the model again and figured out, okay, if A and B are actually the same galaxy and they appear to be, they appear to be the same galaxy multiply lensed, if that's the case, where else might it show up on this entire image? And that's how they found C. So they didn't actually find C by looking at the image with their eyes. They actually had to use models to even find C at all. They didn't know it was there until the models told them to look there. So this, this galaxy you see here, um, blown up in the insets, is actually believed be about 
um, we're seeing the light as it looked about 13.3 billion years ago, 13.3 billion light years. Uh, the universe is about 13.8 billion light, billion years old. So that tells us we're looking at about, these galaxies emitted their light at about when the universe was about 3% its present age. So that's like if you have a, you know, uh, you know, you have a, a grandparent or somebody that's 100 years old, them showing you their three-year-old baby picture, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing. We're seeing some galaxies that are really young here. Okay, so in the few minutes that I have left, I just want to quickly, oh, I just want to point this out. This is just fun. I threw this in at the last minute. This is an actual simulation of what Einstein would look like if you stuck him behind that same galaxy cluster. All right. <laughs> We just lensed Einstein. All right. Um, I just thought it was fitting because, you know, he's the one that, you know, his theory of general relativity helped us. So you could play this funhouse mirror. You could put famous objects. And this is actually done through the lensing model. Um, the scientists actually did this for us um, through the lensing model of the act, that actual cluster. So this is real. This is not just made up. So if you put that picture behind that lensing model. Now, of course, there's not a big picture in space behind that cluster. So, but, but if you did put his face through that lensing model, this is what you would see. All right, so that's just for fun. What are, some, what are some of the results of the Frontier Fields program? Again, studying distant galaxies is one of them. I show you a Hubble um, visible light and a Spitzer infrared image of the same area here. And blown up are these distant galaxies in circles. What's key to remember is, is that Hubble really has the resolution and sensitivity to peer and get the really faintest galaxies and to get basic information on on all the galaxies that we can see in the image. Spitzer is really key with that infrared information to give us inf to give us details about the masses of those galaxies. Okay. Once we it helps us understand the masses and the star formation going on in those galaxies. So we learn more about the galaxies themselves. We learn more about um, the mass distribution um, in those galaxies and so on. Uh, this is a this is again I alluded to this. This is not the science of the most distant galaxies. But from this program, we're learning a lot more about how galaxy clusters, the foreground galaxy clusters behave. And it turns out these galaxy clusters are actually made up of multiple clusters that are actually combining in space and they're gravitationally bound and they're, they're sort of colliding together. And when you get that action, you get a lot of colliding gas that gets superheated and emit in X-rays. And that's what you're seeing in the blue. So the colored galaxies are Hubble image. The blue is the X-ray light. And some effects actually create these interesting radio relics that you see um, from radio light in the pink. All right, so moving on. Also, I just want to mention the serendipitous discoveries. Some things you don't expect to find, but you do. This was the first time that it, a supernova, an exploded star in the universe was actually multiply lensed, to see, seem to be multiply lensed. And what's really fun about this, so you see in the inset, there's that orange blob. That's a galaxy in the cluster. It's, it's doing um, lensing of a background spiral galaxy. And what's wrapped around that blue, wrapped around, is actually the lens spiral arm of that spiral galaxy. And you're seeing that same supernova show up in four places because it's lensed multiply around that foreground galaxy. And what's really cool about that is you, you can actually see when you do the observations that those four supernova actually don't appear simultaneously. They appear slightly at different times, very slightly different times, because the light rays took very slightly different paths to get to us from those four supernovae. And from this, they were actually able to estimate um, when they might see the supernova show up in the other two iterations where they see that background spiral galaxy lensed in the image, which is the top one. So they actually forecasted that they should see the supernova show up again in this image, and it did. And so that's a good, um, just a good show that, that they understand the physics of what's going on um, with general relativity in these galaxy clusters. Okay, um, I'm just going to stop by saying what is the next step in this story? How do we actually see further? Because we actually cannot quite see what we would call first light, the first galaxies, the first stars to form after the Big Bang. Um, the next step really is going to be the James Webb Space Telescope launching in late 2018. And also after that, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope launching in the mid-2020s. Both infrared telescopes, let me just show you why they're so powerful. And to do that, I have to explain why infrared is needed. So a little nuance that I didn't tell you until now about this whole story about looking deep in the universe is that as you're trying to observe these distant galaxies, the whole time the universe is actually expanding with time. And that has an interesting effect on the light from the most distant objects. 
right? So let me play this little schematic, this little cartoon. As light's traveling, the universe is stretching with time, growing, and it's actually stretching the wavelength of light as it travels to our telescopes. And as you stretch the wavelength of light, it gets redder and redder and redder, okay? The longer wavelength, the redder the light. And as it turns out, basically, the longer the, the light takes traveling through the universe, the more stretched it gets. So the most distant objects, light's been traveling for 10, 13 billion years, it's going to be so stretched that it's actually going to be redder than the red part of the visible spectrum. It's going to appear in the infrared part of the spectrum. So you really have to go to the infrared to see the most baby galaxies, right? The, the, early, the galaxies that we can see from the earliest ages of the universe. So these are simulations. Please don't think these are actual observations. These are just simulations done on the left with Spitzer and on the right with what James Webb would be able to see with the same, with the, with that same patch of sky. And the idea here is, is that James Webb is an infrared telescope like Spitzer, but it's basically the next generation of Spitzer. It's got increased sensitivity to the infrared. It's also, I didn't mention this here on the slide, but it's also got greater resolution, a lot greater resolution. You can see finer details. Um, so this is just uh, a simulation to show us what JWST might be able to, sh to, to give us here with the deep universe. So again, we're gonna get that core sample in the deep universe even much further. Um, what is W first going to do? Well, W first is, is not, doesn't have the, the, the resolution sensitivity that, that JWST has. Um, it's not gonna go deeper, but it's gonna go wider. So it's gonna be sort of a Hubble class telescope, um, but it's gonna be able to basically survey the whole sky. And so what I have here on this is, are these two boxes you see here are actually Hubble observations. What Hubble, one box is basically what Hubble can look at at any one time, okay? It's kind of a small field of view. So Hubble can only look at a small patch of sky at one time. So these are deep fields that Hubble took. And that interesting space invader shape you, hear, you see here in the red, that's one staring of the W first camera. So what it takes to do, you know, you could, it's basically a hundred times the field of view of Hubble. So you're gonna, be, you're gonna get these deep fields um, all over the sky, which is gonna be great. We're gonna see galaxies um, looking back in the universe all over the sky. All right, so that is it. Um, do we have, I don't know if we have time for any questions or not, if, or I can take them in chat too if we want, but. Um, well, let's, well, let's just stop for a minute Sure. And see if uh, anybody has a question that they want to enter in the chat or um, or take themselves off mute and just ask it on okay. audio before we um, introduce Scott. Okay. It's, it, of course, when you when, I know that when we do these webinars, sometimes a topic like this, like I, I find my I'm, my mind is completely yeah. trying to absorb all of these um, concepts. And I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Of our participants here. Um, but I am happy to answer questions in the chat or on the Moodle afterwards as well, so. Right. Oh, we do have a question here, um, Brandon, which is, okay. uh, what's the uh -huh. best resource to teach students these concepts? and? Um, I mean, we'll, we'll be uh, we'll be highlighting some resources after Scott talks, um, and, yeah. and 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 uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Is, is, um, yeah, I'll add on as well. I don't know if there is a the best one. Uh, there are a number of good ones that we'll share, and we're also hoping that maybe you'll be able to create a even better resource than some of the things that we've used, incorporating some of those pieces as well. Yeah, yeah, Cheyenne. So it really is possible, right, to travel back in time uh, using using astronomy and telescopes. That is a very it's a neat concept, and and I've yeah. found that um, audiences really like to think about that in 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 different ways. So um, well, there's a few other questions. So I can say the answer to Tim's question: Yes, if there was a civilization on a planet 65 million light years away from us and they, look, they were looking at us right now, they would be seeing dinosaurs. That is, I mean, if they, they would have amazing technology, but <laughs> their telescopes, I'm very jealous, but, they, but if they had the technology to actually see what's going on in the earth, yeah, they would be, they would be, yeah, they would be able to see dinosaurs. That's a great analogy. 
Let me see. A simulator to load. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, there are um, programs like the one that Brandon used to warp the picture of Einstein. There are mm -hmm. um, I would love to see more of that, actually. I think it would be an interesting concept to see, because you could do something like you could warp somebody. What would it look like if you were warped by a black hole as opposed to a galaxy cluster, right? Because black holes are spherically symmetric, and you would get a very different shape, if you will, um, than you would these lumpy galaxy clusters. And all the galaxy clusters would look different because they're all... It's an interesting lumpy. exhibit idea. Yeah, yeah there's, there's the possibility as well. It, it, I don't know if you could model a particular galaxy cluster, but you could do what Brandon was talking about earlier and actually use a piece of glass shaped in a particular way in order to create some odd distortion effects so that you could have someone stand on one side and some object or another person or something on the other side and you would see the light bent in different ways. And that's very analogous to what's happening. Yeah. All right. Well, I think um, with that, uh, I'm, uh, Brandon, if you can release your screen sharing and sure. uh, we'll have Scott Randall from the Chandra X-ray uh, uh, Center here at the um, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics share his screen. I see he's uh, working on that and um, he's going to uh, try and shed a little light on dark matter. So Scott, I'll let you um, take it from here. Okay, uh, thanks for inviting me to talk here today. I got a lot to get through in only about 10 minutes, so it'll be a little bit of a whirlwind, I think, but uh, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to let me know. Okay, so some of the earliest evidence for dark matter actually came from galaxy clusters. Uh, here on the left, this is Fritz Wicke, who is a Swiss astronomer um, and a bit of a character who uh, did observations of the Coma Cluster at Caltech in 1933. Um, he observed the Comer Cluster. Here's a modern optical image of the Comer Cluster here on the right. Um, basically, all the little blobs you see in this image are individual galaxies, most of which belong to the Comer Cluster, which is a very nearby dense cluster. Um, so not only was Wicke able to image it, but he was able to um, take measurements of the speed of the galaxies using uh, basically the redshifting technique that Brandon referred to uh, previously. And I won't throw too much math at you, but I thought this little bit might be interesting. Um, he used a result from statistical mechanics called the Virial Theorem to estimate the mass of the cluster. The idea here is that for a uh, bound, mostly relaxed system, the kinetic energy K is about twice the potential energy U. So the total energy bound up in the, with the motions of the galaxies is uh, about twice the energy in the case of clusters, the gravitational potential energy holding it together, which sort of makes sense, right? If the kinetic energy was much larger than the potential energy, the things would just fly apart. Um, and just uh, using basic gravitational theory, you can come up with this equation here and derive the cluster mass just based on the radius of the cluster, which you can observe just by looking at it. The average speed, which Swicky measured by uh, this redshift, and this is just a constant gravitational constant. And what he found was that uh, there must be 10 times the amount of mass there compared to what the mass that you could see in the stars and galaxies in order for the cluster to be held together. In other words, the galaxies are moving so fast, uh, you needed 10 times more than the amount of mass that you could see, otherwise the cluster would sort of fly apart. Uh, more recently, more evidence for dark matter that comes from clusters is the intercluster medium. So clusters are filled with hot, diffuse gas, temperatures of tens of millions of degrees, and this gas is so hot it shines in the x-rays. Um, this was first detected in 1966 because x-rays don't get through the atmosphere, luckily for us. It turns out they're really bad for people. Uh, but early rocket experiments detected this x-ray emission. Um, and the gas, here the idea is sort of the same. The gas is so hot um, it has such a high pressure. You think you heat up a Coke bottle or something, uh, the pressure inside gets high. So the, pre the pressure in this gas is high enough that it should just uh, evaporate away, basically, unless there's a lot of gravity there to hold the cluster together, to hold the gas in. Um, and again, as Brandon alluded to, 
um, the mass breakdown in clusters uh, is such that of what we see, most of the matter is actually in this ICM and gas, about 10 to 15 percent. Stars only hold a few percent of the mass, and dark matter has most of the mass, about 80 to 90 percent. I just wanted to show you some Chandra images of my favorite clusters to show you they're not just all blobs. So um, again, this is x-ray compared to optical images. Here's the Perseus cluster. It shows all kinds of you know, cavities and loops and features. NGC 5813, something I've done a lot of work on. Um, again, the x-ray is in purple and the optical is uh, yellow and blue here, the galaxies in the background. And then another cluster at the center of a cluster, M87 on the right. So these things look really different in the x-rays. There's a bunch of other evidence for dark matter, which I'm not going to have time to get into today, but I thought I should just at least list it. There's uh, the rotation curves of galaxies. As Brandon mentioned, gravitational lensing by clusters. You can measure how much mass is there. Uh, there's measurements based on the cosmic microwave background, which maybe you haven't uh, heard about yet. I'm not sure uh, if you've discussed this in the series, but fluctuations in the cosmic, cosmic microwave background provide evidence for dark matter. And then there's the abundance of different elements, um, you know, sort of lithium and beryllium, in the context of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis model um, that suggests there should be large amounts of dark matter, and, and there's, there's even more evidence. But suffice to say that there's a large uh, number of independent lines of evidence that suggest there's a bunch of stuff in the universe that we can't see. Um, so dark matter uh, by mass is about 24%. The normal matter that we think of as atoms that make up stars and planets and us is about 4.6%. And then there's this other stuff called dark energy, which arguably is even more mysterious than dark matter, which actually makes up most of the universe that I won't have time to talk about at all today. Um, so what is dark matter? Could it be more of the normal kind of um, matter, what we call baryonic matter that makes up stars, people, and planets? Um, it's really hard to hide, to hide that. Uh, in the universe so that we wouldn't be able to detect it. The diffuse baryonic component should be detectable. Um, for instance, if you're looking through it at background stars, because this dark matter component must be everywhere. Uh, you can imagine trying to put it in compact objects like black holes or planets or something like that. But these um, objects should have been detected by microlensing. Basically, it's very much like the lensing Brennan was talking about with clusters, but on a much smaller scale with, with um, small compact objects in our own galaxy and they haven't been detected and also even making those things in the, in the first place poses big problems for the um, our theories of Big Bang nucleosynthesis which, which does very well in terms of predicting the overall structure of the universe and the abundance of elements. <clears throat> so generally dark matter is thought to be this new kind of um, new kind of matter made up of an unknown kind of particle that is yet to be identified. These particles are broadly called, uh, referred to as weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. So uh, alternatively, maybe our theory of gravity is just wrong. So we have, we know that our theory of gravity works very well on small scales, sort of on the Earth uh, scale of the solar system, um, but maybe on very large scales, uh, scales of the size of galaxies and galaxy clusters, which is many orders of magnitude larger than the scales that we test uh, gravity on locally, um, is, is different. So a lot of effort has gone into this, uh, these so-called modified Newtonian dynamics or MON theories. So far, no one's been able to come up with a self-consistent theory that explains all the observations. So it seems like that's not the answer either, and I'll come back to that in a little bit too. So what can we learn about dark matter from clusters? Uh, here's a cluster that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, that was part of the original team working on this project as a postdoc. This is the bullet cluster. And in this composite image here, you're seeing, again, the galaxies in sort of this orange color. The ICM, the intercluster medium, the gas, is this red pink. And um, the lensing peaks, where most of the mass is located, is this blue stuff here. Um, and you can see that there's a separation between the hot gas and the lens mass peak, where most of the mass is. So the bullet cluster is a merging cluster, um, which, again, Brendan alluded to. Clusters grow through mergers. So what's happened here is you have this uh, smaller bullet cluster that's merged with this larger cluster here. It's come flying in from this direction, flattened the main cluster, poked right through, and gone through to the other side. Now, gas experiences, um, it interacts with itself, so it experiences pressure. So much like when you put your hand out your car window or if you're driving down the highway, you feel the air pushing on it. As this blob of gas came through this blob of gas, it, it felt pressure. 
and that slowed it down a little bit and pushed this guy in this direction. But uh, the galaxies are basically little marbles. They actually don't interact that much. The space is so empty between the galaxies and the galaxy is relatively small. They just kind of fly right past each other. So they don't experience this drag. So when you have this small bullet going in this direction, you actually end up in a separation of the um, gas and galaxy components. And here's a little movie that demonstrates that. Again, the gas is in pink or red and the galaxies and the dark matter, uh, which is coincident with the galaxies, it turns out is in blue. They start off from the same place. They pass through one another and the uh, gas experiences a drag. I'll show you that again. The gas experiences a drag, it slows it down, but the blue galaxies and uh, dark matter just keeps on going and you end up with a separation. Okay, so why are these observations important? The important result here is that um, this observation al alone shows that there must be dark matter, that you can't have an alternative theory of gravity that explains this. And the reason why is you can change how gravity works on large scales. You can say, well, maybe our theory is right on small scales, but in very large distances, gravity is a bit stronger than we think it is, but you can't actually move, by making such modifications, you can't move with the peaks of the total masses. We know that most of the mass in clusters is in the gas, um, but when we look in lensing, we see that most of the mass, the actual total mass peaks are where the galaxy are, and there's a difference. So, so most of the mass we're not, we're not seeing is centered on these blue peaks here. So that's a, uh, sort of a nail in the coffin for these modified gravity theories. A little bit more on this, something I've worked on. So we don't really know the properties of dark matter. So maybe it interacts with itself a little bit like gas, not as much as gas does, but maybe it feels uh, a little pressure when it sort of runs into itself. Um, and here, this image on the left, this is the X-ray, the dark matter peaks are in blue and the galaxy centroids are in red and same thing here optically with just the same peaks overlaid. So if the dark matter experienced some uh, force as it interacted with itself, you'd expect the dark matter to get slowed down a bit too in the same way that the gas does. It would feel sort of pressure from the other dark matter halos. In that case, you expect the dark matter to be, you know, not as much pressure as the gas it wouldn't be back here, but it'd be maybe in between the galaxies and the X-rays. Um, and as you can see from these, these are confidence circles It's basically, um, it's probably not worth getting into. It's 68% uh, confidence it's in this circle, 98% confidence it's in the outer circle. But they're basically in the same place. So what we did was n-body simulations of the system and changed the amount at which uh, dark matter self interacts. And we found that in order to reproduce this system, the self interaction cross-section of dark matter has to be less than about 0.7 centimeters squares per gram. If we're much larger than that, these peaks would be separated by more, and that's not what we observe. And uh, I have one very last slide here, which I don't have time to talk about, but just an, briefly, another thing you can do with x-rays is that some models of dark matter suggest that dark matter should actually shine very faintly in some wavelengths. It maybe decays or annihilates with itself, and you can get weak lines in the x-ray, potentially in the x-ray band or the gamma ray band. Um, and uh, a couple years ago, uh, Ezra Bulbo was working with me as a, as a student, uh, postdoc, sorry, at the time, found uh, unidentified a line about 3.5 kV that was difficult to explain astrophysically. There's a huge amount of interest in from the community and, and both from uh, uh, the media. There, uh, again, I don't have time to talk about it in detail. And the exciting results, it's one of these things, we don't know what it is yet, it, uh, it's been confirmed by many other observations of other observatories. Um, so it's either some unknown astrophysical process or it could be uh, a dark matter decay line. And the point here too is even if you don't detect anything, you can use that to place constraints on some models of dark matter. So if your model of dark matter says you should have a strong line of 3.8 keV and we do this um, very deep analysis of stacked galaxy clusters, which I don't have time to get into, and you don't see it, then obviously that model of dark matter uh, can't be the right one. Um, and again, that was a lot in about 10 minutes. So <laughs> your time, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So Brian, uh, Scott, we have a, a question 
from um, Cheyenne saying that bullet cluster observation seems to support the WIMPs theory, the weekly. And so is, she's asking, is that the leading theory for what dark matter is? And what do you personally think it could be? Well, WIMPs is the leading, dark, leading theory for dark matter just because, as I described, having baryonic dark matter, it's really hard to figure out where to hide it. Again, if you have a diffuse component, you should be able to detect it against background, starlight, and other sources. If you have small compact objects, it's really hard to know how to make them and have that be consistent, successful with bang theory, and we should have detected them with microlensing. So actually though, the bullet cluster by itself does not show that this is, that this is um, a WIMPs. It just shows you that most of the matter in the cluster is at these blue peaks and that we can't see it and therefore it's dark. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's not a new particle. It just means that it's dark matter. So there are, there's other lines of evidence that suggest that. Um, uh, that it can't be baryonic dark matter. Um, and per personally, I believe in the status quo. I mean, I think there's, there's very good evidence that it's uh, some unknown kind of particle that has yet to be identified, which sounds kind of crazy, uh, maybe to people who, uh, you know, who don't study this kind of stuff that much, but there is precedence for this. So, so I don't know if you guys have talked about neutrinos, but for example, neutrinos were predicted based on particle physics models, and they're this type of particle that almost never acts, interacts with matter. Right now you have millions and millions of neutrinos streaming through you from the sun and you don't feel it. But they've been very, very highly, uh, significantly verified to exist experimentally. So you can have these weakly interacting, part weakly interacting particles that have mass and it would just be a new type of particle that we don't know about yet. And I, I think that that's the most likely solution to this problem. Um. Another question, uh, Scott, the bullet cluster simulation had pink crescents early on in the simulation. And he's asking, is that a tidal interaction or an initial condition or what, what is that? So I guess we're talking about this movie. So yeah. In which case, this is not a simulation, I should point out. This is just an animation um, that was done to demonstrate the concept. Oh, so these crescents, I guess, is, is maybe what the... Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think this is just the beginning of the offset between the gas and the dark matter. So if you have a pink circle on top of a blue circle, you start to move the pink circle off as it experiences drag, you're going to see this sort of crescent-like shape as it starts to get pushed apart. And then it gets flattened because of the interaction. So, so... So Scott, the idea here is that when the uh, when those clusters were originally on the opposite sides from each other, the pink and the blue would have been coincident. Correct. Yes. And, so it's maybe a little hard to see here, but right. Yeah. But then when the clusters move through each other, the the dark matter and the actual little bullet uh, little pinpoint galaxies all moved together in a blob, but the gas kind of got smeared, slowed down in each direction. Exactly, the gas experienced pressure as it crashes into it, the, the gas from the other sub, sub cluster, but the dark matter and the galaxies do not. So they end up being separated. That's wild. And I, I just have another question that might be in other people's minds. How long, over what period of time, would this have taken place? Is there any way to determine that? Well, again, we did pretty detailed simulations of this system. So we know that this, this part of the merger that we're looking at took a couple of giga years, so a couple of billion years, uh, which is typical for a major cluster merger. For a long time. <laughs> Great. Well, we, we, if, if there's no other quite thank you very much, Scott. You've, you've kind of stretched all our minds now around. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Um, and uh, if there's other questions that come up, we have an online forum for the same participants here um, that we think you can answer. I'll forward them to you if that's all right. Yeah, please do. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, Thank you for joining. And I guess next we're going to have um, uh, 
Tim talk about some of the resources. Tim, are you going to share yes, your screen? Yes, I am pulling that up now. And let me hit present on this. That working for you? Yep. All right. So we've got a few things that I'm going to point out for you today. Um, and we're going to start off with the Frontier Fields blog. Brandon mentioned the Frontier Fields uh, project. Uh, the observations have finished, uh, but the science is still ongoing. The blog has also finished, as uh, the observations have. Um, but all of, the, all of those really cool uh, things that they were talking about, a lot of the science is still up there and posted, and you can access it and learn a little bit more. This is a great place if you want to find some more information um, about what was happening with this project, um, where they were looking to the very deepest stuff we've been able to see yet using that gravitational lensing to see the furthest and oldest stuff yet. More to come. Um, I also want to make sure I point out the Universe Discovery Guides. Uh, this was a collaboration between a large number of uh, NASA astrophysics related organizations. There are 12 different guides, one for each month. Uh, they're all complete. They're all hosted at Night Sky Network, and you can see the link right there in the slideshow, and this will be up on the Moodle as well later. Um, but the one for May is particularly relevant to what we are doing today. Um, we're looking at a, a, a scrapbook of the universe, but there's also a, a feature. They've got a feature every month. Uh, this one happens to be on the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, there's also a great activity called Cosmic Survey. Um, it's an activity, maybe some of you have run this before yourselves. Uh, I know it gets used in a few museums already around the country, um, but it's an activity organizing different celestial objects by size, by distance, and by age, and kind of making the connections. And there are a couple uh, objects from here on Earth connected into that as well to give a little bit of context. Uh, there's also a little uh, section in there about specifically telescopes and time machines and the Hubble Deep Field Academy. Um, all some really well-connected stuff if you want to explore a little bit more. Um, I also want to mention, this is not a universe of learning product, the uh, NICE network, but they are uh, getting a funding from NASA Astrophysics, just like us, and they are providing lots of materials out there for, uh, related to NASA Astrophysics to museums. There are uh, some toolkits in particular, which are important. Uh, in tw the 2017 ones are there, there are digital versions, so you could see what sorts of materials you might need to be able to use in your uh, on the floor of your uh, museum or gallery. There are uh, instructions for running activities and explanations and everything. And they're also currently uh, putting together the 2018 toolkits and the applications for those uh, are currently up. In But the applications are due before November 1st. So if you would like the NICE Network to, you don't have to be a, a part of it, but if you're interested in them uh, actually sending you some stuff that you can use on the floor, uh, go there, check out the toolkits, go ahead and apply. Um, James Webb Space Telescope science videos. So going back to that idea of the James Webb is going to be able to see further back in, further away and further back in time than anything we've been able to do yet. Uh, we've collected uh, and produced a number of videos related to the science that James Webb is going to be doing. Um, feel free to browse through. There are a whole lot you could use in a number of different situations, but there are two in particular that I think um, are, are particularly relevant today. The first one is looking back in time even farther. Um, it's a segment up there narrated by Aliyah Shawcott. Um, some of you may know her. Um, and that will go into a little bit of the science. Also, we've done some work with Minute Physics. Um, if any of you have seen those pieces on YouTube, um, there's one, there are a number on the site. Uh, where do galaxies come from, though, is uh, related to this idea of the universe changing over time and the further away something is, the earlier we're able to see it and being able to see to those very earliest baby galaxies when they're having all of those changes. The last thing I'm gonna point out today, Inside Einstein's Universe, this is a legacy product from, this was developed back in 2005, but it is still relevant today. Um, in particular, there's an item, Journey to the Beginning of Time, and I'm just gonna show you, because this might be a little bit difficult to find. Um, so let me 
jump out of the full screen here. If you go to that link, you're gonna to get to this page inside Einstein's Universe. There's a whole number of resources. Part way down the page, you're gonna see Journey to the Beginning of Time. And in that window, you can see a script. There are also some PowerPoint slides, um, a few other things. But there's this lovely kinesthetic activity that you might be able to riff on when coming up with something of your own. Um, and this image here uh, comes from one of those PowerPoint slides. Basically, uh, it's having different people represent very far galaxies and very and nearer galaxies. They're assembling their galaxies at the same time, and you have other people act as photons to actually carry that information uh, from those two different places. They need to leave at different times so they can arrive at the observer on Earth at the same time. And even though the process of putting them together acts the same way at both locations, the information that gets to Earth looks different. Um, I recommend checking out those resources. Take a look at some of those pictures, which explain it much better than I can do in my brief time here. Um, and maybe take some ideas about how you can get across some of these concepts more than just through uh, a, a presentation or a, a video at piece, but actually getting some people to work with things. So I believe that's it for the resources. Erica now has a few things to talk about what's coming up. All right, so just a few technical reminders about the program and everything that's happening. Next week, hopefully many of you know, is the Affiliations Conference, um, and we will be there on Tuesday. I believe Patty has tried to email many of you. We'll be having a birds of a feather lunch, uh, 12.30 to 2 at the Holiday Inn, Washington Capitol. There's not food at the Capitol, but there are food trucks nearby. You can grab them and bring them to come join us for lunch. We'll be talking about the application process for mini funds, as well as giving some examples of successful applications. Um, so come with your questions. We'll answer them as best we can. And if we don't have an answer that day, we'll bring them to you. We'll bring them back to you on the portal online. We'll also be at the resource fair. We'll have um, so lots of things to share, opportunities. So if you can't make it to the Birds of a Feather lunch, stop by from nine to 11 on Wednesday morning. All right, next slide, Tim. All right, and believe it or not, we're actually halfway through our webinar series. Today, we uh, completed webinar number four, looking out is looking back in time. We have a couple more, one more coming up and how did we get here? And then following that, we'll be talking about are we alone? Um, and then come November, we'll be opening up the applications. And starting next week, we'll discuss a little bit more about the timeline for applications. We'll share it at the Birds of a Feather Lunch and then post it online for, on the portal for anybody that can't be there. Next slide. All right, so now on to your assignments. Uh, continue to contribute to the weekly discussion topics. We're starting to get some good conversations on there. We'll respond to you as quickly as we can. Uh, I saw some great ideas for some um, programs and event ideas, so post them there. We'll share what kind of other resources might be helpful as you think about what you want to do with your universal learning resources. Uh, then join us next week at the Birds of a Feather Meetup. And next one's next slide. Finally, in two weeks, we'll come oh. back for our Dynamic Universe webinar. I, for, I forgot to change the date on there. It's, it's in October, two weeks from today. <laughs> yes, that is the wrong date. I see that now. <laughs> two weeks from today, we'll be back with our next webinar. All right. I think that's it for our reminders and upcoming questions. Anybody else have any questions before we leave you today? Well, thank you all for joining us and hopefully we'll see many of you next week. All right, thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.